to get a job writing for games. Uh, my name is Zach Garris. I'm the creative director at Deck Nine Games. I'm Tracy John, studio lead of narrative design at King. So thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. Why are we giving a talk about how to become a narrative designer? Uh, it's because game writing is awesome. It's uh, one of the most, I think, privileged uh, things you can do for a living is getting to craft interactive story. It's, uh, it's, it's really fun. But the industry is really difficult to get into. There's an opacity about how to get a job as a game writer that we really want to kind of challenge and, and talk about. Uh, and both Tracy and I have very different journeys um, through our careers, and we thought it would be really fun to kind of talk about what, it, like, what our stories are uh, from both, both angles. So uh, we'll start. I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Zach. The first game I published as a narrative designer was Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. I worked on several RPGs before that that were never released. Um, then I went to college later in life, because I'm kind of a weirdo. Uh, I studied classics, so ancient history, ancient myth, Latin, Greek. Then I worked in TV for a bit. Um, worked on the show Criminal Minds Beyond Borders, did some indie stuff. And my last game was Life is Strange Before the Storm. Uh, where I was the narrative director at Deck Nine, and I was responsible for hiring and uh, training and leading the, the writer's room that produced a 1,500-page script for that game. And I'm currently the creative director at Deck Nine, um, driving our story-driven uh, studio. And uh, a little bit about me. Um, so I had a bit of a weird career as well, weirdo in a different way, though. Um, <laughs> I started off actually as a games journalist, uh, where I interviewed a lot of developers and learned about the process of making games. So I like that so much. I uh, applied for a job and got a job at as a, as a narrative designer at Gameloft, uh, where I worked on licensed games and original IP. Uh, after doing that for a couple years, I took a break from games and I went uh, to do some corporate work. <laughs> but I, that included UX design for mobile apps and, and VR and doing some work for advertising. But um, after that, I missed games so much, so I came back to King, uh, where I am now. So, um, so just to give you, that's just to give you a little background about us, but we can launch right into um, our, our tips for the application process. So first thing we get a lot of questions about is uh, the portfolio, um, where you want to present your summaries of your best work, and you want to be specific, and you want to contextualize it. So of course, you know, CV, duh, you should definitely include that. But also, uh, your published game work, if you have any. If you don't have any published game work, uh, published game work is, or published non-game work is, is also great to put here. Um, but with that, also do whatever you put, your best writing work. So whether you've been published or not, uh, pick the stuff that is what you represent, uh, feel represents your best work. And then from there, you want to, of course, put work that's related to the jobs that you're applying for. For example, if you're applying to, you know, for a mobile game company with a lot of match three games, Make sure you have stuff that exemplifies that um, and not just 100 page movie scripts. So just think about that kind of thing. And then of course, don't put too much. You don't have to put your entire body of work in your portfolio. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, employers won't necessarily be able to look through everything. So pick your, your top uh, work and put it on there. And I would also say here, don't necessarily put writing tests that you've done for other jobs. <laughs> Um, I just think, uh, that's my personal opinion, I don't know, uh, I think Zach feels similar, but um, I, would, I would not do that, it's more just to show that, uh, you know, I don't want to see that you've necessarily applied to all these other places, I don't want to see the great work you've done for other, other game companies, even though it's a lot of hard work, um, keep that for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, also me. So, oh, some other tips, though, as well, for portfolio, I would say, um, if you can get help from a graphic designer or use a lot easy to we read website templates, there's a lot of stuff out there now. There's kind of no excuse for a really ugly, illegible portfolio. Even if you use a WordPress blog, a Tumblr, there's a lot of um, templates out there that can really make your portfolio legible. Uh, if you can, describe what you did for the game. I get a lot of um, portfolios that show me like an awesome trailer and splash image, and there's nothing wrong with including that. But you know, maybe tell me a little bit about what you did. Did you write the opening cinematic? Did you write VO barks? Did you write the UI text? Give me, you don't have to put the actual scripts for those things, but at least explain and give a little bit of context about what you did for this amazing uh, launch trailer game. So, and. Yeah, so um, if you've never actually published a game, 
Um, or if you're working on something exciting, but it's under NDA and you can't talk about it, which is super frustrating when you have to apply for a new gig. There's still ways that you can demonstrate your skills and what you've learned. I I'm curious if I could ask the audience, how many people here want to become a narrative designer? How many people here have published a game as a narrative designer? OK, OK, awesome. Congrats to everyone who has. And for those of you who haven't yet, don't despair. So what I look for when I'm interviewing writing applicants, narrative design applicants, who can't talk about something they published, I ask them to talk about the, the themes and the elements of their work, if they're not allowed to talk about it under NDA, talk about the themes and the sort of foundational principles of what makes it exciting to them. Because I'm not interested in just hearing some title or IP. I want to understand your mind at work. I want to see uh, you and hear you talk critically and passionately about the elements of your story work that you find compelling, that you think is exciting. Um, so maybe you're working on a new Walking Dead game and you're not allowed to talk about that at all. Uh, but you can talk about what it's like to write about human existential dilemmas and how everyone's a fucking monster when zombies are in around. Or don't say zombies, because, uh, because maybe that would break your NDA. But if you can talk about the work in some way that shows me your passion and, and your heart and your, your critical thinking at work, I'm going to get what I need from that conversation. And I'm going to get a better insight into who you are as a writer. OK, so the cover letter. It's basically an introduction. You're, you're telling your story to the company that you're applying for. Think about it like a story with an arc. And the culmination of that arc should be that you are destined to land comfortably and, and naturally into the arms of whatever company that you're applying to. So tailor that story really to, to make a plausible case for why you belong wherever you're, uh, you're trying to belong. Include in that uh, information about your writing experience, published or, or not. Talk about why, specifically, you want to work at the particular company that you're applying to and demonstrate in the answer to that why an understanding of who they are culturally, what their values are, what their body of work is like, and how you as a writer will be able, through your writing sample, to immediately create value for them by writing to their style, uh, but to their voice, because that's what they're looking for. And then maybe this is obvious, but include the name of the company in your cover letter. Include an understanding of, of who they are and make it really, make a deliberate effort for your cover letter not to sound like a form letter where you're just swapping out Blizzard instead of Bungie and, and sending off the same, the same cover letter over and over. Awesome. And so now that you've got your cover letter down, submitting the application. This is a little bit of housekeeping stuff, um, but uh, employers notice these things. So I'm gonna harp on some really minute details here, but you want to keep it clear and concise, but uh, label the file names clearly with your name, uh, CV, and cover letter. Uh, we get hundreds and hundreds of applications, and if you put, just simply put your name on there, you, you want us to be able to find you quickly. When I look in my folder of like, oh, I really like, you know, this person's uh, stuff, I want to be able to easily find it, so it's simple stuff, but, but please do that. And then when you do that, please label it clearly with the name of the correct company that you're applying for. Um, to Zach's point earlier about Blizzard or Bungie, like uh, I don't, I've, I, this has happened to me where I've gotten applications and they put the name of not the game company that they're applying for, but clearly another one. So just, just check those things. Because that, even though you may have a fantastic cover letter or CV and, and body of work, like it's those little things that like, uh, that attention to detail that's really like, can be off-putting if I see that you're, you know, put Bungie in and, and you're applying to King or something, so that kind of stuff. And then um, if the job description doesn't ask for writing samples, send your portfolio link uh, or a relevant sample anyway. I think some companies might be either, uh, for legal reasons, don't specifically ask for samples or they, you know, maybe it's a new person putting up a job description and they don't include that, but I think that uh, if you just submit one, that will save the employer a lot of time because uh, that's happened to me once where um, someone, for, uh, someone uh, my HR person who forgot to post at please submit writing samples didn't for like two weeks. And then I got all these resumes, but then no one submitted writing samples with their resumes. And then I, the ones I liked, just the CV, I had to go back and ask them for their samples when I just feel like that should just be a part of your, your application package. So just, again, minor house, housekeeping things that I think matter a lot um, for when you're applying for a job. Yeah, so if you're applying for a junior role and you don't have any experience, you're almost definitely going to have to take some kind of writing test. You're going to get a prompt, a challenge, a window of time to complete something, and then you get to demonstrate your, your writing ability under a deadline. 
how to do that well. Don't be late. Uh, game development is all about executing to a very specific and rigorous schedule. If you're late <laughs> out of the gate with a writing test, it's really going to hurt your chances. If for some reason the deadline that you're given in the middle of the recruitment process isn't something you can hit because of whatever's going on in your life, that's okay. Proactively, ahead of time, communicate with the recruiting officer, whoever you're talking to, and say, hey, I'm not going to be able to hit that thing Monday because I'm graduating from college on Saturday. Can I get a couple extra days? I'll be able to do it Wednesday by 5 p.m. Ahead of time, awesome. That's proactive. That's, uh, that's a commitment that you're making, and then execute and, and, and hit, that, hit that commitment. When it comes to the prompt itself, don't just jump in and rush through. Really think about what the prompt uh, is asking you to do creatively. Think about what the company you're applying to needs and what they want. Usually, a, a lot of thought has gone into the crafting of the writing test. So really demonstrate an engagement, uh, an equal en engagement with, with sort of that, that level of care and write something you, you, you're really going to be proud of. On a higher level, consider who you're writing for uh, and, and really try to demonstrate in your prompt uh, that you understand their voice and their style and that you can execute to that level and that if we were to hire you tomorrow, you would be able to start creating, creating value, writing within, within our voice uh, immediately. And then this is, this is really crucial. Uh, enjoy what you're working on. Uh, I, I work with uh, writers all day long at all levels and it's something that I have to remind people of all the time. But if you as a writer are not taking joy in what you're crafting, I'm not going to love reading it. Uh, so, so even at, at the test level, I think especially at the test level, have fun with what you're crafting. You're building something that's supposed to be entertaining and compelling for your audience. Um, focus on that, and, and you'll, you'll generate something really great. Okay, so you get through the writing process, the, the, the test, and now you have an interview. I want to encourage all of you to think about interviewing not as demonstrating your worthiness to some institution or, or body of experts. Uh, it's not all on you. You're really, it's a two-way street. And ideally, applicants that I really resonate with and, and want to work with uh, come to the table sort of striving to find whether or not my company is a good fit for them as much as they're trying to demonstrate what they're capable of doing, doing for us. Uh, so, so do that. Um, I would say take time ahead, ahead and prepare questions about the role, about the, the studio culture, about the job and, and the other teams you'll be working with. And take some time to think about difficult questions that you'll get asked and prepare answers in anticipation of that. And look at your resume and say, OK, so if I was going to throw a really difficult question at this person, what would it be based on their experience, based on their body of work? And then, then you, you won't be caught flat-footed, except you definitely will be caught flat-footed. But don't dismay. I think in the middle of an interview, if you get a, a, a difficult question, if you get a question that uh, you feel like, man, I really should know the answer to that, and I don't, be honest, be humble. One of the best answers I ever hear in an interview is, oh my god, that's a really hard question. I don't know the answer to that. My best guess is this. As devs, we are constantly confronted with things, and we don't have any idea how to solve them. We want to work with people who have humility and, and have honesty, intellectual honesty and creative honesty in, in how they talk about the work and how they approach problems that they're, they're not necessarily uh, you know, sure, sure about it, how to answer. It's a process of discovery. So demonstrate that honesty, demonstrate that humility, and you're going to be demonstrating a person that I want on my, my dev team. And then the same thing with the writing test. Enjoy the experience of interviewing. Uh, have fun with it. Be excited to meet, meet devs and, and talk to them about their work and, and what they're working on. Be excited to advocate for yourself and your experience and your story. Uh, have fun, and, and you'll be performing uh, a version of yourself that ideally you know, people want to work with. Great. And just also some additional tips based on the interview. I mean, uh, to what Zach was saying before in terms of preparing. Um, you know, as employers, I'm definitely going to ask you <laughs> if you've played the games that we work on. <laughs> uh, you'd be surprised at how, how many people actually don't do this before an interview. So uh, you, it's not like you have to finish them. It's not like you have to memorize them or, or complete everything about them. But I would expect that you at least check them out and have some general thoughts or even just the context around it. So, you know, Wikipedia is there. Just, you know, look it up. <laughs> and don't, but definitely don't lie about it. If for some reason you didn't play it or, or, or whatever reason, don't say that you finished it when you haven't. Don't, we, we will be able to tell. So. We'd rather you have an honest dialogue about it um, than, than lie about it. So, so don't lie about it. 
And of course, uh, be prepared to talk about the narrative design of either the games or the company you're working for. This goes to thoughtful preparation, but um, as well as just your thoughts on narrative design in general or games, you know, that we may ask what's, what's your favorite narrative design in other games. And so be, be able to talk about those in a passionate and informed way. Um, be prepared to talk about your writing test, you know. Um, we're going to ask you your thought process. We know that we gave you an impossibly short amount of time to do it, so don't feel that you have to be on the, the defensive about it. We just want to ask, like, what, why did you do this? What did you think about this? So it's not so much as like a sort of critical uh, feedback time as much as we just want to see what you, why you did what you did in such a short amount of time. Um, and yeah, a, 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 a more, more of a housekeeping thing, but a lot of times, um, this goes back to Zach's point about thoughtful questions, but at the end of the interview, I'll usually ask, like, do you have any questions for me? And you know, I, I, I love questions about craft, how I manage you, uh, you know, st specific things about games we've worked on, uh, process, but a lot of times, too, I'll get questions about, like, oh, how many vacation days and things like that. And those are all important, for sure, but I would expect that you would ask those from the HR person and not me, and that makes me just think that, oh, did you not have any other questions about the craft? So just, you know, just be mindful of that when, you, when you're about to ask those kinds of questions. Um, but, you know, if the interview, you do the writing test, the interview goes well, and then you got the job. Hooray! But now what? You know? <laughs> no. Thanks, Zach. So, now that you've gotten the job, though, we also wanted to talk about, if you get the job, uh, what happens afterwards. And Zach is going to talk a lot about craft. Okay, so narrative design. Um, if you do everything right that we're talking about with regard to labeling your CV, how to navigate the writing process, the interview process, uh, but you're not growing as a writer. Um, one, I don't know that you'll actually get the job, uh, sadly, but it's true. Uh, but two, um, your work will grow stagnant and, and you're going to have a difficult time sort of navigating your career past this first opportunity when you finally get your foot in the door. Okay, so the high-level question I ask all writers of all levels that I hire, um, I ask them to define what their goals are as an artist. And I would challenge all of you to think about that. Almost agnostic of where you're working now and where you're applying to next, you should always be asking, who am I as an artist? Who am I as a writer? What are the stories that I want to tell? What are the stories that are invigorating me or challenging me? And, and the purpose of asking those questions, you should have answers to those questions, uh, cultivate answers to those questions, that should change over time as well. If you as a writer are not changing, uh, if you're not actively sort of asking, asking yourself what you want to be in your artistic praxis, and the answer isn't shifting to some degree, then you are potentially falling into a place where you will not grow. Okay, so who do you want to be as a narrative designer, as a writer? What kind of work do you want to work on? As you're navigating the answer to that question, curate uh, a, a deep understanding of narrative media. Maybe you only want to work on open world RPGs. That's cool. Play mobile narrative anyway. Uh, watch TV, watch film. Be able to talk about story in any and every way. It matters at the interview level. It matters in the day-to-day -day work. And truly great writers learn to steal from anything. And then in your own artistic praxis, not just as you're applying for a given job or one project after another, just as you're, you're building a body of your own work, be critical, challenge yourself. Recognize the fact that you are building a body of work and, and be, be deliberate about what it is you're choosing to write, where you're choosing to spend your creative energy in service of this large, larger question about what kind of an artist do you want to be. A really helpful aid in that journey is finding a writer who's more experienced than you are who will read your work, spend time with you, talk to you about what they're seeing, give you notes, and challenge your thinking. And they're not going to be right all the time. You don't have to take every note, but be committed to that kind of discourse about your work, and you will improve. Abandon any kind of discourse about your work at that level, and, and you will not. And be courageous. And part of what I mean by that is, I think bad writers fall into a habit of not challenging themselves to, to craft new things. They either work on one thing that they've written that they like and they never put it down and they keep polishing it, or they fall into a very specific niche with their work. They write for comfort. They write because they fantasize about this particular job they want to have somewhere, and that's really good. But in terms of growing as an artist, it takes courage to push yourself to write things you're not used to 
to, to write in new media, uh, and to write stories that are maybe non-traditional for you. You will learn from that process. And some, some more notes on craft, but in addition to defining your goals and cultivating your interests, uh, take the initiative to improve yourself. And I think this goes for new narrative designers, aspiring narrative designers, as well as experienced narrative designers. Um, there's always, always looking for ways to improve. So some tips, um, whether it's your first narrative design job or your 10th, always strive to learn about the other disciplines and departments and work together. See what their thoughts on narrative are and how do you uh, fit into their process and culture as a narrative designer. This will help you at any job that, that you go to. Uh, watch GDC Talks. Thanks for coming to this one. <laughs> uh, but there's also, there's also a ton of great stuff that happened this week and in, in, in uh, previous years on the vault. So, um, you know, everything is easily available now thanks to the internet. So um, there's definitely no excuse and there's no shortage of narrative design uh, media in terms of videos and books nowadays. So th there's, there's definitely stuff everywhere. So no excuse to not check out that stuff. Uh, network. Yes, that's why we're all here, isn't it? But <laughs> network, it's super, super hard. As writers, I know we're all introverts. And I mean, even me being up here right now, I'm like, Ugh, I had to talk to people. I don't know, but no. But it, it's, some, it's super important. We wouldn't be here where we are without networking. I mean, every job that I've ever gotten was through someone I know or, or through a friend of a friend. I think Zach's had some same thing. So uh, networking is super important. So it's great that you guys are here at GDC. But even if you can't come to GDC every year or you, can, you, know, or you have friends who can never make it to GDC, there's definitely like local meetups that you can go to. Um, you know, there's IDGA. There's there's tons of stuff out there. Or start your own group and just get people in your commu local community interested. And you guys can all talk about narrative design and share advice. There's also a Facebook group that I'm a part of. Um, I could talk to you about it after. That is all uh, aspiring game writers and narrative designers. So that's those are there's a lot of great places to to network, not just in person but online. Um, be critical of yourself, sure. Um, you can always improve, but also don't forget to be kind. Um, narrative design and game writing is hard. So, uh, but with that being said, uh, also be hopeful. So, you know, throughout the years, I've gotten tons of rejections <laughs> uh, on stuff, on jobs, on things I've written, on written pieces. But you know what? Never, never give up. Never lose hope. Keep trying. You know, the first games job is the hardest one to get, but once you get that. Then, then, then your career will only uh, keep growing. So don't give up. OK, so um, I give advice to people a lot of the time. When I only have 30 seconds or a minute, um, I, I basically distill all of my advice down to one thing, um, which is being a good writer is about discipline. Um, I think we often get into this business because we're really excited by the things we consume, the things that inspire us. We're passionate about it. And we think, what if? It would be so fun. The actual practice of becoming a great writer is um, not, I think, succeeded in short bursts of inspired creativity. You find success when you develop habits, habits of production, habits of challenging yourself, habits of writing and, and of, of networking and, and, uh, and, and really uh, pursuing, almost aggressively pursuing your growth. Um, and that, that, just takes, that just takes discipline. If you can find that, as a writer, you will succeed, definitely. Uh, we got the five minute sign, so I'm gonna blow through the key takeaways to make sure that we have time for your questions. But overall, don't forget, uh, be clear, choose the best work that represents the job that you're applying for. Uh, be concise, choose samples of your absolute best work, don't include everything. Uh, and most importantly, be yourself. Don't be afraid to show who you are and your interest and your passion for storytelling, no matter what it is. Just authentic authenticity really shines when it comes to both your work and in in-person interviews. Okay, so we said do lots of stuff the right way. Don't do other things the wrong way. That's all good. <laughs> I love that bullet. Um, just to calibrate your thinking, this is what I tell aspiring narrative designers all the time. If you adopt a healthy practice of applying to places and you accept the fact that you're going to get rejected 100, 200, 300 times, I have been way more than any yes I've ever gotten. If you can accept that fact, you can almost court 
knows. You cannot be afraid of rejection because it is inevitable. It's not a question of if I get lucky. It's a question of when I find the right place at the right time for my craft and, and, and the, right, the right studio. And I, uh, when I was desperately trying to get my foot in the door years ago, I derived a lot of comfort from that. And, and I, I know a lot of other writers who have too. And then when you do succeed, uh, remember to help, help the next person along the way. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. So, so we, have, we have a few minutes, but really we have as much time as anybody wants because there's no talk here after this one. If any of you would like to ask questions, I think there are microphones. Okay, we have, mi we have a microphone. Um, raise your hand or, or whatever, and we'll stay and ask, answer whatever you got. Can we have everyone make a line or something, possibly? Yeah, maybe a line makes sense. Let's do that. Hi, thank you guys for the talk. Very happy to be here and listen to all your wisdom. Uh, question, so I have a lot of experience writing poetry and prose, not a lot of experience in script writing. And I've heard that when you apply for jobs, you should submit like screenplays or, or teleplays. Can I get your feedback on that? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll answer, did you just take a picture? Yeah. Okay, I'll answer that. Um, it depends on what you're applying for. So if you're applying for a company that does cinematic work, you should have a strong uh, cinematic script, absolutely. Um, if you're applying for uh, something that's maybe more prosy, and there are game, game, game studios out there generating products like that, I think prose is perfectly fine. The, one of the last writers I've hired at Deck Nine, the vast majority of her experience is fan fiction and prose. And, and we make highly cinematic content. Her work was really great. And, and so we were, and, then, and we talked in the interview for sure about like, how comfortable are you writing cinematically, writing screenplays? And she's much more comfortable with prose, but I can use that tool in our process for sure. Um, and that, this, I think, goes to a higher level uh, piece of advice I'll share. Build a portfolio that has an excellent cinematic piece, a screenplay of, of, that you're really proud of, a prose piece that you're really proud of, um, and maybe start there. You, next level would be a twine uh, interactive something that you're really proud of. And you can submit the right piece for the right gig. And then also, if, if they ask, show the versatility that, that you've acquired along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hey there, uh, first of all. Um, again, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm a narrative designer and writer from New York. Um, and one thing I was interested in is you mentioned the idea of finding a mentor, like someone who you can develop a long-term connection with and can, who can uh, really help push you forward. Um, my question for you is, do you have any advice for how to go about uh, finding such a person? Uh, yeah, so I think the, that it's really hard. Um, share your work in digital spaces, uh, for sure. Um, go to events like this and introduce yourself to people. Uh, and then I think local meetups are probably your best bet. You might find them themed toward narrative, I'm sure you will, but even if they're just larger IGDA groups, you can just walk around, and I'm, I'm the worst at this, I hate, I hate networking, um, but it's so, it's so important. But go to those events, awkwardly introduce yourself, talk about what you're passionate about, and when you find someone who you think like, oh, like that guy's local, and he's awesome, and he likes this thing that I also like, and he's published that, ask him to read a piece. I, I usually start with that. Be like, hey, I really like what you're doing. Would you mind reading one of my scripts and telling me what you think? And maybe you get one round of iteration. That's more than you had before. Maybe it starts a conversation, a relationship, uh, um, a mentorship relationship that, that you can get a lot more value of. Yeah, I would add to that. On, like online communities for sure and just like see who bites because... I, I feel like I could do a whole micro talk on mentorship because, you know, be respectful of their time. Like, you know, pick your strongest thing and stuff like that. But uh, I think, like... Um, there's also like a IDGA, so women, women in Games, definitely has a mentorship where you can even sign up. I don't know if there's one for um, broader narrative design, but I, maybe it's something we could start or look into. But um, yeah, I think you know, online is definitely your best bet to start if you can't find people in person here. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so first of all, a quick question. You mentioned a Facebook group. What is the name of that? Just so I can uh, look it up. I think it's Game Writers, but um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm part of a lot of Facebook. It's very yeah, it's super generic. So let me 
find that, and then I'll share it. Whoever afterwards off okay. the mic, I'll, uh, I'll share that with you. Uh, so I think it's open with group regards too. to writing samples, uh, what, what are you looking for in terms of length? Shouting. Uh, short is better than, than long. Um, 10 pages of anything is a lot for me to read right now. Um, the best thing you wrote is, is 35 pages or 95 pages. That is not what you should submit. Uh, challenge yourself to write something new. Um, a 10 page screenplay that shows some witty dialogue, a clever arc, a fun moment, uh, a filmic understanding of narrative. That's great. That's all I need to see. Um, something that makes me laugh out loud once, and I'm like, oh, cool, okay, I'm interested in this. I want to move the conversation forward. Um, but, I, you know, I've had, I've, I've probably read about 750 to 1,000 submissions from writers over the years now. I've had people apply with 300 pages of work. Um, I don't even know where to start, and so I don't read anything, because I don't have time, because everything's on fire. Um, but, like, a 10-page something, and I'm looking, yeah, I'm going to read it. So I really, that's where discipline comes in. Um, but really focus on something, something really tight, something, something short. Uh, just to add to that, I mean like, at King, it's more mobile, so definitely like if, uh, it's not 100 page scripts, but even if you have like, I don't know, a, a movie script that's like 50 pages or something, and I would say distill it down to your best scene, but then also give us context for it, so that way we can still get an idea of, of, of that, those few pages. So that way you also aren't only writing 10, I mean, if you have 10 page screenplays or, or less, perfect. But if you have something that's longer, but you still want to show it, I would say choose the best small portion of it, but give us a prose paragraph of context before we go into reading that, so. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, curious, what is the value of secondary skills when you're applying to a narrative position, and what is the best way to present them to a potential employer? Yeah. Um, so by secondary skills, do you mean like coding? Yeah, coding uh, or art. Yeah. Uh, that's very valuable, I think. Um, the most important is your writing. But uh, like I can't, like the nature of the work that we make at Tech9, I don't hire any writer who can't code a little. Um, uh, or, or, or pick it up very quickly, but that's asking a much higher investment from, from us. So if you have any experience in any scripting language, that's great for me. That never hurts in, in game development at any level. Uh, take one introduc introductory CS class online and you'll have everything you need as a narrative designer. Um, so include whatever language you did that in and that, that's wonderful. Um, did you have any other secondary skills? Like, like None specific. But to that, I mean, for uh, like, you know, for mobile, I don't necessarily need coders. Although if you could do that, awesome. <laughs> but uh, like, if you're doing, if you're an artist and you do story storyboards, you know, or if you can draw like somewhat and you do rough storyboards to go with a, a piece that you wrote or a script that you wrote, that's awesome. Or if you have project management skills, um, when you talk to me in the interview, uh, you know, tell me how your narrative process, but how you dealt with other disciplines. Uh, so producer project management skills, th that kind of works as well. So uh, it depends obviously on what the secondary skill is, but there are definitely ways to frame it in uh, this helps me as a narrative designer context. Does that make sense? Hey, I'm the, I serve as the dungeon master for my friends and Dungeons Dragons and whatnot as a creative outlet and you know, making adventures and stories for my friends to overcome. And recently I've considered maybe like writing those down to like little adventures the, and PDF files. I was wondering if that's something that may be worth sending to potential employers as a work sample of something that's not only writing but kind of design in its own way. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it depends on the nature of, of what it actually looks like. Um, so if you're applying for a narrative design position, I would, unless they're asking for something like that, what's a campaign you've designed? What's a story-driven campaign that you've designed? It's actually a really cool question to ask applicants. But unless they're asking for that, they're usually asking for something else very specifically. Definitely have that other thing, whatever it might be. Um, and I would say that, that sounds to me like something that could be a really interesting thing for me to find in your portfolio. If you have a website where it's listed, uh, I, you know, I, I discover that and I look at it and I'm like, wow, this is really nerdy and really cool and, and, and it's showing you know, a, a design skill set that, that could accompany narrative really well. I think, I think that's great, but I wouldn't lead with something like that because you really want to demonstrate whatever specific uh, writing skill uh, the role you're applying for needs. 
I guess one more question would be, uh, so would something like a short story be more what I'd lead with? Yes. All right, thanks. It could be a D&D &D short story. That's great. Just make it good. All right, guys, the AV tech is going to have to, you know, shut the mics down, but you can still get your questions in. Just, you know, it's going to be a little bit more intimate. Everyone's going to start, you know, sharing warmth. Everyone huddle together. But, um, yeah, uh, if you guys want to, you know, stay in here. Uh, or can we out. stay in here? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay, we'll stay for like 20, 30 minutes if people want to talk. Oh, come on down.